from New York City for our viewers worldwide. A very good morning. I'm Manus Cranny in for Jonathan Farrow. So equities can't get a bid from GM. The 800 pound gorilla is in the room. It's called tech. What will it do? Fill or kill to the bid? This is Countdown to the Open. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up on the show, it is the busiest week for the earnings season. It heats up with big tech in the room. Traders await the next Fed decision, the U.S. jobs report, and the President of the United States, Joe Biden, faces mounting pressure on the conflict and to confront Iran. We begin with a big issue, big tech. It's definitely one of those action-filled weeks. An important week, huge week for MAG7. A big uh, MAG7 uh, tech earnings. All the mega cap companies, Amazon, Apple, Alphabet Report. It's really about the earnings numbers. 40% of the S&P market cap reported. By and large, we've seen 2024 estimates hold up very well. Tech earnings are supposed to be up in, in double digits. When you think about what has been holding up the market, has been propelling us higher, it's those big tech companies. From a profitability perspective, tech is likely going to be the sector that can deliver. I think they are going to be the leaders for earnings growth. We certainly do hope that those companies deliver. And look, I think there is a decent chance of that. Joining me now for their perspective on risk, it is Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab and BlackRock's Russ Kostrich. Russ, good morning to you. Good to see you. Kathy, good to have you with me. There's something for everybody here. It's like Oprah. You get a quarterly refunding that was good news. You get record after record that's great news. And you've got an 800 pound gorilla in the room that is tech earnings. I want to just stand back on risk. How important is this week for risk for you, first of all? Russ. Well, good morning. Uh, it is important uh, for a number of reasons. I think the most you know, relevant is that last year was a very multiple driven market. We had a phenomenal year uh, that happened primarily on the back of a resilient economy, decelerating inflation and multiple expansion. Now this year, stocks are already on the rich side. Uh, we've already had a lot of the adjustment on inflation. So I do think gains this year are gonna be more earnings driven, which means what we see from the leaders in the market, and of course that is tech and related names is gonna be a big driver and how the market does in 2024. We're constructive. We think we have an environment where nominal GDP is solid, call it four to four and a half percent. Uh, earnings estimates at 10 or 11 percent are reasonable, and tech should continue to lead on the earnings side. Okay, they best not disappoint. Uh, you saw what happened last week with one or two of the stocks. Kathy, let me bring it to you. I mean, it, it, it's nirvana for you in the bond uh, and the fixed income world. You've got a quarterly, uh, a quarterly refunding, borrowing requirement that's going down, and we think we're at the peak of these auction sizes. Is that a short-term boost to a longer-term problem? Well, uh, our view is much like Russ's. A lot of good news is priced in, so there's some risk that things uh, don't go according to the plan. But overall, we do think we're on solid ground in the fixed income markets. Um, you know, we have never uh, really worried too much about the auction sizes uh, because the auctions they'll come and they'll go, and okay. somebody will buy them. And you know, domestic households have been more than happy to buy U.S. Treasuries between 4 and 5 percent. I think the, the focus of the areas we might worry about are corporate bond spreads, very, very low, um, about the narrowest they tend to get uh, historically. So there is some risk, I think, if the equity market doesn't hold up as well as expected, that we could see some widening in spreads on the corporate bond side. Interesting. It'll be it'll be on the corporate bond side, as you say. We just keep rolling up for rich fours and four and a half percent in terms of yield. So it is all about big tech, and it is about the earnings shifting into high gear this week. Alphabet and Microsoft will kick off the magnificent seven results. That is after the closing bell. Let's bring in the Bloomberg team to discuss. We have Mandeep Singh and Anura Rana. Mandeep, a good morning to you. Uh, let's kick it off with you. I mean, this is. This is sort of the, the, the moment when we really understand what's going on with advertising, what's going on with cloud, what's going on with the overall sentiment in AI. What does it mean in the prism for you? 
Well, the mood of the moment is generative AI, and I, I think in Google's case, uh, they've had a strong moat in search, you know, for uh, almost 20 years, uh, and they have almost 90% share, which right now people are questioning whether, you know, the generative AI wave is going to hurt their search market share. Too. So to me, the key is they keep outperforming on the search. You know, the uh, consensus numbers are around 12%, uh, so uh, they should exceed that, and then YouTube, I think, will be where the upside will be relative to consensus, because what we saw with uh, Netflix is streaming hours uh, continue to be great, and uh, you know, YouTube has that subscription plus ad monetization, which I, I think will drive upside, because for two billion users uh, spending more than an hour a day, they definitely have the engagement more so than all the other streaming players. Yeah, well, it's certainly going to be a benchmark in terms of the appetite for advertising. If we talk about Microsoft, Anurag, this is going to be how much more are you outside of AI, or is it all going to be about AI within the Microsoft numbers? Yeah, from Microsoft, it's going to be how much is cloud going to grow and how much contribution of AI is going to be there. I think consensus has growth at 27% for Azure. I think they need to beat that number by a big amount and also give a strong guidance because the stock's done so well in the last few months, so expectations are very high. Um, I think 27% is an easy target to beat, but by how much? And that's going to dictate you know, how the stock does tomorrow. Okay, uh, well, we keep an eye on both those stocks. Uh, Mandeep Singh and Anurag Rana waiting for the countdown to big tech after the bell. Uh, Kathy Jones and Russ Koistrich are with me this morning. Russ, take it to you. You still believe in mega tech. It continues to post strong earnings, and it is your largest overweight. We are walking into this tech reporting season, though, completely unclothed. Protection against downside is very, very low. Are we walking naked into this reporting season? Well, look, I, I think, as we were talking about a moment ago, expectations are high. And clearly, this is, this is a trade that a lot of people are in. You know, that said, I, I'd say two things. Uh, one, we do believe a lot of the drivers, whether you're talking about AI, whether you're talking about you know, the further adoptions in evolution uh, in, in social media, in search engines, you know, the, these are longer term factors. They're not something that goes for six or 12 months, particularly AI, the impact on the semiconductor space, we took, think something that has legs. So again, you may want to trim your exposure, but it's something we still want to have in the portfolio. And that said, we have actually balanced out the portfolio a bit. We are still long tech, we're long mega cap tech. It, it is our largest overweight. We've been balancing that out. We've been balancing that out with what I would call high quality cyclicals in airlines, in autos, in parts of industrials. And the logic there is we have a decent economy. And while tech is certainly not cheap, other parts of the market are. You still have a environment where a lot of that premium valuation has been driven by a handful of names. Mm -hmm. And when you go below the surface and you look at different sectors, you find that many of them are trading below that long term median. So we have actually trimmed back a little bit of our exposure in some of the winners from 2023. We've been adding to high quality cyclicals to try to get a bit more balanced in the types of exposures we have in the book in 2024. And, and Kathy, we'll, we'll talk more about the Fed and, and QT in, in just a moment. But there's an interesting word that Russ uses there, which is about balance, trying to find balance in that equity portfolio. For you, balance in fixed income you talk about the credit spreads i mean they are tight uh, and some would say price to perfection if there's a bit of a backup it may come in high yield where is balance for you in the fixed income to credit allocation so we're neutral in other words we haven't uh, gone overweight or underweight on credit and we are concerned that those spreads are so tight and obviously if there is a disappointment in earnings, if there's a disappointment in the economy or even in Fed policy, I think you would probably feel it in the lower credit quality area. So uh, we're a little bit cautious on high yield. We haven't gone underweight, but we are a little bit cautious in that um, there isn't a lot of room to maneuver here if there's a disappointment, either on the kind of macro side or uh, for the underlying companies. 
And the, the story has been, well, um, the lending has still been there and with some of these companies can extend, make it to 2025 when, when rates are lower. But you, you are looking at much higher financing rates for a lot of companies with the lowest credit quality. So that, that is a big concern, particularly if the economy stumbles or if the Fed doesn't accommodate as quickly as possible. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is the risk. And if that's the evolution of, of thought, we'll, we'll get a little bit more opinion on that uh, in just a moment with Mike McKee. And we'll reset with Fed Day for tomorrow. Kathy Jones and Russ Koistrich uh, staying with me. Joining me to look through the stocks ahead of this opening bell, Abigail Doolittle is with me. GM is on fire. Abby, what else have you got? It is absolutely on fire. We have GM uh, popping by 7 to 8% the last time I looked. They put up a very solid uh, beat for the fourth quarter, beating uh, bottom line estimates by 7%, revenue by 8%. They expect profits to continue to grow this year. SUVs are real cash cows. This as they uh, are committed to investing in EVs. Super micro microcomputer, take a look at that gain, up 10.4%. They put up a big sales beat. They raised their fiscal year revenue guide. And apparently the good results are helped out by improved supply. Plus, yes, you guessed it, AI-driven demand. UPS, though, not so much. Although it is off the lows, the stock now down 6.2%. They missed fourth quarter estimates. They reduced their guidance. They're cutting 12,000 workers. All of this on sluggish package demand and higher labor costs, Manus. Yeah, we're just looking for those canaries in the coal mine, Abby, aren't we? 12,000 jobs to go at UPS. Abby, thank you very much. We'll touch base with you a little bit later on. Coming up on the show, uh, we're counting down to the Fed. It continues. I don't think that it's going to be a snoozer. Um, and what we expect him to do is to lay the ground for why a March rate cut makes sense. That conversation coming up on Bloomberg. market volatility we've had with every little like second tiny minutia of data and information I don't think that it's going to be a snoozer um, and what we expect him to do is to lay the ground for why a March rate cut makes sense right we have PCE on a six-month annualized basis already at their target core PCE already at their target on a six-month annualized basis um, they have already laid the ground for looking at balanced risks and as we know, um, the job market is, is softening. We're seeing a narrowing in the sectors that are hiring. That was Constance Hunter, senior advisor at Macro Policy Perspective, speaking a little bit earlier on Bloomberg. And the Fed's two-day policy meeting, it kicks off today. Investors are bracing for a rate decision at 2 p.m. tomorrow, followed by probably the bigger event, Chair Powell's news conference. Mike McKee is here to tell us what we can expect. Mike, good to see you. So the bigger event is probably the language rather than the decision. Well, it's going to be interesting to see, and I'm not sure how Constance defines a snoozer, but it may not be as exciting as the refunding in the morning, and that may not be exciting either. All of a sudden, the plot has changed here. The Fed not expecting any surprises because certainly there's not going to be a change in interest rates. Now, likely news, we'll probably see a change to the tightening bias, no more uh, how much more we have to raise rates. But then comes the question about do we get anything that moves the markets? Do we get guidance on rate cut timing or guidance on the balance sheet? Probably not in the statement. Will Jay Powell give us something? That's worth watching. Now, the borrowing needs tomorrow, the uh, quarterly refunding announcement is going to be interesting because if you look at what we have been borrowing quarter after quarter, and there's a bad quarter in there because of the, uh, the debt ceiling issue, but you look at the latest numbers for the uh, first quarter of this year and the second quarter of this year, they're lower than had been anticipated by the market. And so now the market is thinking maybe Treasury doesn't have to do as much. Um, there is an issue with refunding tomorrow, and that is uh, whether or not the uh, Treasury Department decides to sell fewer bills. They ramped up bill selling after the debt ceiling issue to try to rebuild the Treasury general account. Now they've uh, really started to bring it down. And also, uh, how high do they let that Treasury general account go? Those will be uh, key questions tomorrow. There'll be a couple of other key questions as well, but maybe not market moving. 
uh, unless we get a change in auction sizes, because Treasury is no, not going to be borrowing as much money as they thought, and if we get a continued decline in bill funding, and they're going to tell us about that, then there is a plan to start buying back off-the-run Treasuries, and they did say they would give us a report on timing for that in the uh, refunding announcement tomorrow. So Manus will be watching for that. So the people who are on the bond desk do have to come to work tomorrow. Whether they get surprises or not, we don't know. Well, let's hope it's not a snoozer. Mike, thank you very much. It makes for a very dry, uh, dry wall painting in that case. Kathy Jones and Russ Koistrich are with me this morning. Kathy, um, I don't, well, who knows what tomorrow's going to be, but it certainly uh, has the potential to be a snoozer, but you say it's more of a potential to shift to neutral. So how do they do that? Yeah, I think there's a couple of mechanisms, as Mike mentioned. One will be changing the language, taking out the business about, you know, how much more tightening there might be. So keeping a much more neutral, balanced risk approach. Um, I don't think that they're laying the groundwork yet for a March rate cut. I would say May is more likely. Um, that's at least what we have penciled in. And that's because they do have to address the quantitative tightening program, uh, we've ha heard from Lori Logan of the Dallas Fed that they're um, looking at, um, you know, shifting that to tapering the pace of that because of uh, liquidity needs. And so that has to be introduced. Usually, I would think that they'd want to introduce that before introducing rate cuts. And then there's the issue that the economy is doing fine and it's not urgent to cut rates. So I think the, anyone looking for an indication that we're getting a March rate cut might be a little bit disappointed because I'm not sure that they'll want to hone in that precisely yet. So a couple of steps to be had first, talk about tapering quantitative tightening, uh, talk more, take the uh, tightening bias off the table and, and go to balanced risk, um, and then address um, the underlying uh, economy and um, it, you know the financial conditions, tightening financial conditions versus easing financial conditions. So there's a few things to do. And then finally, there's the rotation. We have uh, new members, as you get every year on the Fed. And um, I'm not sure they want to walk out the door and, and make a big statement at this stage of the game. You know, this is the first time uh, this particular group has gotten together. So unless it's urgent, why would they make a big splash? Yeah, hold their powder dry. Now, Russ, you say we're, we're going to go into this world of maintenance cuts. This is about the balancing act between real rates uh, for you. And that, that that's the most pressing issue. So maintenance cuts with no dramatic slowdown is your base case. We, we do expect the economy to moderate, normalize this year. But yes, I, I think what we're talking about here is not the Fed cutting because they're seeing significant weakness or signs of an imminent recession. But again, uh, making marginal adjustments as we see inflation decelerate. And if that's what we're looking at, you know, that is an environment where the Fed is not under any particular pressure to start immediately. They're not necessarily under pressure to go to 50 basis point cuts. Uh, it's one where they can be measured. And again, we have an economy where Q3 and Q4 GDP prints were both you know, very strong. We've got a labor market that is softening, but still very solid. Wage gains are decelerating, but still well above the level that's consistent with the Fed's inflation target. So the notion that they're going to begin very quickly, that they're going to go aggressively, that's not what we see right now. We think it's more likely they start up. You know, again, I agree with the notion of a May or June cut and three or four being a more likely uh, schedule than going five or six times. Um, there was one thing that I have noticed, and it's this debate. I'm looking at the five-year break-evens, Kathy, specifically. Two years are ticking up about 30 bips higher than we were in December when we last had the last Fed meeting. Seasonality can play a lot, I, I'm given to understand, um, by the team when it comes to the two-year to the short end. But at the slightly longer end, the five-year, five-year, I mean, that's also moving higher. So we have this discrepancy between a very well-behaved <clears throat> Why don't I just take a drink of water and make all our lives a lot easier? We have this discrepancy between the five-year, five-year and what's going on with the PCE, which is sub-3%. Does that, does that jar for you? And I'll have some water. Uh, it's not necessarily jarring. You know, you do get some movement around in the five-year, five-year forward and, and the inflation expectations numbers implied in the tips market and liquidity uh, does get to be a bit of an issue there. Uh, but I, I would say the overall picture has been 
that um, inflation expectations have been really well behaved in this cycle, perhaps more than anyone would have anticipated given the spike in inflation that we got. What we are seeing and have seen throughout this cycle is relatively tame uh, intermediate to long-term inflation expectations. And I think the Fed can take some, some credit for that and some comfort in that. Uh, in the sense that we're not seeing uh, things really diverge uh, mm -hmm. quite dramatically. And, and I'm on the same page with Russ. I, I, you know, May or June start a gradual keep uh, real interest rates from spiking up anymore and doing more harm to the economy, but sort of a gradual approach. As long as we're in a good place with the economy, um, I think the Fed really needs to, or really wants to take this gradually and find their way. You know, Jay Paul talked about driving down a, a foggy road. I think it was a foggy yeah. road uh, and not being able to see well in it, it, ahead of him. He loves those auto metaphors. <laughs> and, and I think that um, there's still a little bit of fog on the road ahead. Okay. So the Fed can take it gradually. Well, Russ has a lot more clarity than Powell. And I, I, I like this, Russ. You said for the first time in over a decade, FI fixed income can, can contribute meaningfully. So just very, very briefly, how much more meaningful addition in fixed income would you make at this stage in the year? <clears throat> well, you know, I agree with with Kathy's coming before. You know, this is a harder time to add, particularly in you know, high yield or IG. A lot of what we have in the portfolio we, we we bought in 2021, 2022 when spreads were much wider. But you know, the short answer is whether you're talking about IG, high yield, securitized parts of EM. You know, it's been 15 years since you've been able to rely on the credit portion of your portfolio yeah. to make a significant <clears throat> income contribution. And we think in that sort of multi-asset spread portfolio, you can get six and a half, seven, seven and a half percent. That's a big difference okay. when you're talking about five years ago. So we have had meaningful positions in our multi-asset portfolios with the goal of getting a nice tailwind in terms of the overall total return. Russ, thank you very much. Kathy Jones, Russ Koistrecht, uh, with their views on fixed income and equities. Coming up, your morning calls. Uh, Troy Gayeretsky joins me for this full investment service for you ahead of the opening bell. Time for your morning calls. Look at some of the analyst recommendations on the street. First up, UBS upgrades Spotify to a buy. The analyst says the stock has room to run as efficiency gains play out. Next up, Oppenheimer downgrading five below to perform rating. Uh, that's on slowing growth dynamics. And finally, Wells Fargo downgrades Western Alliance to equal weight. Uh, the analysts say the company's current results guidance leaves little room for error. The futures just dipping into the red before the cash bell rings. We are nervous ahead of these big tech earnings. You've got Alphabet and Microsoft tonight. They will define the trajectory of how much AI you are prepared to pay for. There you go. We're rolling over to a slightly dip on the opening. That is the opening bell. We are nervous. The 800-pound gorilla of tech can fill or kill on risk. These are the rest of your markets. You're looking at your dollar up an eighth of 1%, despite uh, the rhetoric around easier ECB. The ECB may perhaps uh, cut more and earlier than the Fed. Uh, you're looking at 10-year yields ticking down ever so slightly. Again, you have this narrative in the bond market that the quarterly borrowing estimate was cut yesterday. What does that mean for the auction sizes? And crude ticks up by a quarter of 1%. We'll have more on Aramco's ambitions and production in just a moment with Will Kennedy. But stocks are what we're here to watch at the open. Pfizer is taking away. The company is beating the analyst estimates. The government is returning fewer doses of its COVID treatment than predicted. Abigail Doolittle joins me with that Abby. 
Uh, well, man, it's very important about that profit is the fact that it's a surprise pop profit. The street had actually been looking for a loss of 19 cents. Instead, uh, they put up a very small profit. And as you mentioned, it had to do with the fact that the government did not return as many of those Pax Paxlovid COVID-19 treatments as expected. But overall, for Pfizer, after dropping 43% uh, last year, it's about looking to the future. And interestingly, that means looking to oncology. They, of course, acquired Seijin for, I believe, 41 one billion dollars uh, so they were able to maintain reiterate reaffirm their full year view so perhaps some expectation uh, that they have the numbers right after a very difficult again 2023 as the COVID-19 treatments to some degree disappointed and now we'll have the focus on cancer treatments into today again after that 43 uh, percent drop last year down five percent and betting, man, is that Pfizer investors really hoping that 2024 is going to be a bit brighter. Okay. I mean, thank you very much. There you go. Pfizer up just under 3%. Stick with the earnings. AMD will report after the bell with a focus on chip demand and AI. What else can we talk about in this work? Katie, what have you got for me? What's the curtain raiser? Well, there's a few things to look at when it comes to these AMD results after the bell, especially given Intel's weak forecast that we heard last week. Uh, investors will be looking at demand for computer processors. But of course, Manus, there will be a lot to say when it comes to AI and really AMD's push into AI infrastructure. Specifically, investors will be looking for any news around AMD's new MI300 accelerator chips, which just began shipping. And remember, these are the chips that are designed to challenge NVIDIA's models. And as such, you have Susquehanna writing that while they expect guidance there to actually disappoint, it's going to be the most important piece for investors in this print, given uh, that MI300 update we're talking about, because investors really waiting to judge the upside for AMD when it comes to AI. AI. So the stakes are really high here. And uh, when it comes to AMD's valuation as well, that is really in focus. It was actually downgraded by Raymond James today to in outperform from a strong buy. So they still have a lot of conviction on this stock. But the analysts there say that the stock is already implying around 20 percent unit share for the MI300 uh, among AI GPUs. So again, stakes are very, very high. We're going to see what AMD actually delivers in just a few hours. Katie, thank you very much. We'll count down to those numbers with you. Let's turn to the automakers. GM beat on the expectations uh, for profits this year and uh, an improved outlook on US sales. Isabel Lee is with me. And this is Mary Barr really telling the market perhaps the worst is behind us on CapEx in EV uh, and indeed the outlook for the US. The worst is indeed behind us, and this is really interesting, man. So General Motors forecast adjusted EPS that beat estimates for 2024, and for the fourth quarter, it also projected a forecast that beat estimates. And this is quite interesting because the bullish outlook stems less so much from an uptick in sales, but more for on the belief that the worst is behind us. Remember, last year GM was one of the companies that was really affected by the UAW strike. So GM. GM said adjusted EBIT for all of 2023 came in at 14 billion. That's on the high end of their November forecast. And the current year, they're seeing adjusted EBIT in the range of 12 billion to 14 billion. So that's also just shy from their November high of 12.4 billion. Evercore said this is one of the most dramatic ways to start the year when it comes to guidance. Well, Jeffrey said that this shows GM management is running, quote, a tight ship. Shares of the company is surging. Now it's up almost 8%. So the guidance this year is really based on strong profits, but it really shows that it's spurred by optimism about a soft landing, which is in stark contrast from the caution that Mary Barra and the company expressed last year, Manus. Indeed, as well. Thank you very much. Uh, keeping an eye on GM. Tune in to Bloomberg TV and radio a little bit later on. We have that interview with Mary Barra uh, in terms of our outlook on China and uh, is the worst behind in terms of the narrative for EV CapEx. Completely different story now. UPS, the shipping company, missing estimates, high, really as a result of higher labor costs and lower package demand. UPS also announcing it will cut 12,000 jobs and ask workers to return to the office five days a week. Simone Foxman, it's a lot to digest within the UPS numbers. Yeah, that's right. But I think CEO Carol Tomei summing this up well, 2023, she called it, was a unique and difficult year and that she's focused on controlling what we could 
control. And that news about those 12,000 job cuts expected, UPS says, to yield uh, $1 billion in savings this year. Remember, put this in the context of that $30 billion agreement that the company struck with its union of Teamsters over the summer. That is a five-year agreement, but expected to significantly increase those wage costs. When you dive through the numbers here, fourth quarter sales, missing estimates, revenue down 7.8% year-on-year. Average daily package volume also down a similar amount on a year-on-year -year basis. Analysts really focusing immediately on the 2024 guidance, though, which also missed expectations. Revenue now expected to be 92 to $94.5 billion. The estimate was for 95.7, so well above um, what we actually are seeing from the company. Annual sales will just rise about 1.1%. That was after a 9.3% job. So we're ne really not seeing that rebound that many had anticipated. Again, challenges after that, um, that uh, labor agreement, those drawn out talks, winning back business that UPS lost during the summer is going to be a key challenge looking ahead. And then of course, macro pre pressures. People are going back to the store. They're not ordering as much to their houses anymore. But Jefferies, which has a buy on the stock saying, you know, Wall Street's expectations were too high. Last year, the company set its own expectations too high. So this new New guidance may set a floor for expectations and could set up a beat and raise, but clearly we're not seeing that enthusiasm in the market today with shares down now, now close to 7%, Manus. Okay, Simone, we'll keep an eye on UPS. So what have we got? We're going to count down to jolts, jobs, and of course the Fed. And my next guest says this, the latest data series on the U.S. economy continue to roll in and are collectively painting a mind-bendingly rosy picture of the U.S. economy. I thought it was all joy out there. Troy uh, Gajewski joins me now from FS Investments. Troy, I, I, a hint of uh, skepticism in you there, but I go on to read the rest of the note. And you are max bull for the next 12 to 18 months. Is there nothing can blind me uh, in this light? Good morning. Hey, good morning. No, I mean, uh, Max Bull would be a very strong statement. I mean, the, the point of that strategy note was just to articulate, you know, the wonderful journey we've really been on as an economy here the last six to nine months where, you know, even we last May when the bank started to fail and bank lending was stagnating and obviously the Fed was draining their balance sheet and it just hiked up rates at the fastest pace in history, thought the probability of recession was at least marginally above 50 percent over the next 12 to 18 months. But if you think of the data as it's rolled in here the past nine months, what you see is an incredibly resilient economy. Yeah. Um, obviously, the labor market continues to be somewhere between warm and red hot. It's cooled from white hot to warm to red, but that's important in order to bring inflation down. You know, business fixed investment continues to be very strong, driven somewhat by fiscal stimulus. States and municipalities, for the most part, are in very good shape, and labor hoarding is a real thing. So. You know, from an economy standpoint, you know, and as a firm, we're very focused on private credit and, and middle market private equity. You know, what we've been rooting for is the Fed to hike as aggressively as possible and keep rates as high for as long as possible without cratering the economy. And, and here we are. And so at one point we referred to it as the dare to dream scenario. And now it's really a base case. It, it does make us a little bit nervous that that's more consensus now. Um, and then, of course, you have the economy, but then you have capital markets. And really, the problem for investors now for markets is, you know, equities are at very elevated multiples. Um, yes, earnings should be reasonably strong this year, uh, but it's, it, it's unlikely to get more multiple compression. And if something goes wrong from a liquidity standpoint, you could have some downside, particularly with money supply still shrinking. And then in fixed income, as your guests were discussing before, you know, a lot of the juice that was there, you know, uh, by October ha is no longer there because the 10 years dropped from five to roughly 4% and you just don't have that much upside left. So, you know, uh, there's there's the real economy and there's markets. The real economy is in relatively good shape. It's just going to be a lot harder to generate the returns this year like we saw last year in 2020 or 2021. So where does that drive the liquidity that's going to come to bear, Troy? Because we've got money market fund money, we've got institutional money. As you say, if I'm fully juiced on quoted markets, do I then reach into private markets more aggressively and more dynamically? Is that what you're seeing from, from, from the client side? Yeah, so I think the biggest challenge for all investors, whether you're a large institution or a small retail investor and everything in between, is 
you know, when you think about the cash piles that have built up here the past, you know, three, four years, you have, you know, roughly 2.3 trillion more in money markets, you have another 4 trillion more in commercial bank deposits. And that was a logical step because there was a lot of uncertainty. And obviously, you were finally getting paid something for cash. And so now the challenge is how do you deploy that intelligently at a time where risk is fully priced in markets? And, you know, fortunately, there's a whole host of what we refer to as Northwest Quadrant and Fisher Frontier strategies where you can incrementally take more risk um, and significantly boost returns, whether it's senior secured commercial real estate lending, middle market corporate lending, middle market private equity is probably the greatest uh, example of where you can go for growth without taking undue risk right now. So, so that's the challenge for all of us, is how do we gradually deploy those cash piles in a way that's not taking undue risk, but still generates either a high single digit or low teens return. And because the asset class has become so much more democratized, you, you don't have to be a sovereign wealth fund or a large uh, major endowment to benefit. Even in many cases, credit investors or smaller can benefit. Uh, so it's a really wonderful transformation of the industry um, no need to reach for too much risk. There's plenty of options out there that can achieve your asset allocation goals. It's interesting. I mean, Apollo obviously launching new, slightly more retail oriented, if you can call it retail oriented products, uh, perhaps for the high net worths. Uh, so every day we're just banging on about Big Tech Magnificent Seven, and we talk about the premium. Uh, you've got various notes out talking about the premium of Mag Seven. Today it's Kalanovich talking about premium, 34% premium yep. to the rest of the index. You would warn that the potential for my upside here is perhaps more limited than a spook and the risk on the downside. So you wouldn't necessarily increase allocation to that kind of collective at this juncture. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so when you think it through, you know, to Marco's point it is, you know, almost an incredible perfection has been priced in. You know, we're not big buyers of like, you know, sell growth, you know, sell the Magnificent Six or Seven mm -hmm. um, or the Six Plus Tesla because they're great companies. They have great free cash flow generation. It's just the market's been incredibly distorted and those multiples are so elevated that you really need continued good news in order to provide any upside. And it's just unrealistic to get further multiple uh, you know, expansion. But in the event that there's some free cash flow disappointment the next several quarters, you know, you could see another retracement like we had August, September, and October of last year. This time, not necessarily driven by higher back end yields like we got then, this time driven more by fundamental disappointment on free cash flows. I, it, it's refreshing to have gone through sort of six or seven minutes and not talked about the Fed, but let's finish off with it. We have to, <laughs> They're kind you, of important, right? <laughs> you know what? You know what? Actually, I'm just going to just rip up the script. I'm going to skip the Fed for tomorrow and I'm going to jump to jobs on Friday, which yeah. is, you know, you talk about the job market going from white hot to just warm, but it still bodes well for the consumer. But yet you are worried about the consumer's capacity to deal with a, a wobbly moment. So, so just talk to me briefly about the consumer. Uh, we've got jobs and we're paid well. Consumer remains strong? Yeah, so the consumer, again, I think it's really important to unpack it and think about it from a standpoint of where the consumer is today versus 12 to 18 months ago. So, you know, the job market has certainly cooled. And again, that was very important from a standpoint of constraining inflation and eventually having this you know, soft or no landing type environment. Um, but obviously the savings rate has come down dramatically. It's roughly half of what it was pre-pandemic as an example from, you know, a seven handle to a high three handle. Okay. A lot of the excess savings um, that everyone expected to be run down by the summer of last year, there's still several hundred billion left, but the clock is ticking on that. And so what that basically means is in the event of some unforeseen shock, there's mm -hmm. less shock absorption capability um, in the U.S. consumer to, to absorb it. And this is very, very important in 2022. Remember, pretty much every contributing factor to GDP went negative. You know, federal government spending, business fixed investment, the housing yep. market, trade, inventory. But the consumer was still incredibly robust. At, at this stage of the game, there's more fragility there, particularly in those that have more floating rate debt and have been constrained by higher debt service costs. So, you know, it, it's it's not a moment to uh, be Pollyannish or, or assume that the probability of recession is zero. I mean, the probability of recession is still... It incrementally, it incrementally oh. rises. It incrementally rises. I get it. I get it. The, the, the hint of caution. Yeah. Troy, thank you so much for being with me this morning. Troy uh, Gajewski with his thoughts on the markets. Coming up, tensions are simmering in the Middle East. We'll respond decisively to any aggression. And we will hold responsible the people who attacked our troops. We'll do so at a time and a place of our choosing.
We're live to Washington with the very latest on the response from the United States of America on Bloomberg. Anyone looking to take advantage of conflict in the Middle East uh, and try to expand it, don't do it. We will respond decisively to any aggression. And we will hold responsible the people who attacked our troops. We'll do so at a time and a place of our choosing. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken there weighing in on this weekend's deadly drone attack in Jordan. And the pressure is mounting on the Biden administration to find the appropriate response, tough enough to deter Iran and its proxies without sparking a direct warfare with the Islamic Republic. Kayleigh Lyons is with me. So what are they saying in Washington? You have some real hawks calling for aggressive action. But really, this administration needs to thread the needle and find a response that delivers a message without heightened conflict, direct conflict between the United States and Iran. Yeah, Manis, it's a very fine line to walk. The Admiral John Kirby, the spokesperson for the NSC yesterday, said there is no easy answer here because on the one hand, you are exactly right. It isn't just about retaliation for this attack that killed three U.S. troops, but making sure another attack like this doesn't happen again because we have seen more than 150 attacks on U.S. soldiers, soldiers in the Middle East by Iranian proxies since October 7th when the war between Israel and Hamas began. So they want to deter these things from happening in the future. That may mean a stronger response than the strike we've already seen the U.S. conducting against Iranian proxies like the Houthis, for example, but calls from some members of Congress to actually strike Iran directly may lead to concern about escalation in the Middle East. Of course, Iran, for its part, says that diplomacy should be the way forward here and that the White House knows that as it has tried to distance itself from this particular attack. One other factor to keep in mind here, Manis, is there are active negotiations happening right now for a ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas, stopping the hostilities for a certain period of time, perhaps two months or longer, in exchange for the release of hostages still have held by uh, Hamas, which, of course, is an Iranian proxy. And other Iranian proxies, like the Houthis, have said that they are acting in support of Hamas as it has this ongoing conflict with Israel. So if we were to see some kind of ceasefire agreement, even a brief one, that could lead to a cooling of tensions overall. Katie, thank you very much. Katie Lyons there, tracking the very latest nuances in the Middle East. Let's stay on that track. Saudi Aramco announced an abandoning of their plan to boost oil output capacity, raising the questions about oil demand. Or does it? Well, Kennedy, we're very lucky to have you in situ in New York this week, our senior executive editor for Energy and Commodities here with me. Um, look, when you sat down in the seat, I was trying to try big threads together. You said, no, man, it's, this is Aramco cutting back on the original targets from 13 million barrels a day. It's a pragmatic response. They haven't said exactly why they're doing this. Uh, they just announced that it was happening. And it, look, it, it's fair to say that it was a, quite a dramatic U-turn. This had been a, uh, a widely trailed uh, plan to invest billions of dollars to increase the kingdom's capacity. And they've suddenly said, no, we're not doing that. But I think we need to look at where they are today. They are producing just 9 million barrels a day of oil. It looks clear from the market balances, and demand is part of it, sure, but supply from shale and elsewhere is another part of it they're not going to be needing to produce and supply 13 million barrels a day anytime soon. So at a time when the kingdom needs money to finance other plans and it gets a lot of money from Aramco dividends, it probably made sense for them not to spend these billions of dollars on going to 13 miles a day, maybe keep some of that cash, maybe up the dividend, we shall see, um, and redirect some of that money um, elsewhere. So I think it's a realistic recognition of where the market is today and what the demand for Saudi oil is. Globally, it's only 9 million barrels a day right now. It isn't going to get fundamentally to 13 million anytime soon. And uh, maintaining that kind of uh, unused capacity on your books is an expensive thing to do. It is indeed. I'm just looking at what RBC reckon. They think that uh, the overall budget 
could come down by $5 billion uh, in terms of the original numbers in the Aramco uh, statement. Let's see what they say in March. Will Kennedy, thank you very much. Uh, context around the Aramco ambitions and plans. Uh, some sector price action for you this morning. Let's get back to Abigail Doolittle. Abby, what have you got? We're looking at a tiny decline right now for the S&P 500. Pretty evenly split beneath the surface. Not a lot of drama, as John would say. Energy down about uh, half a percent. This, of course, is oil is about flat. We have the financials up about four times of 1%. Right now, we have slightly more sectors starting to turn down. On the month, though, let's take a quick look at one sector that's going off of the charts, and that, of course, is the SOX, the S&P 500 Semi and Semi-Cap Equipment Company Index, up 12%. Really quite a January so far, Manus. That is a whopper, isn't it? Abigail, thank you very much. Hopefully the, hopefully the chip stocks will deliver. Coming up, the market moving events that you need to keep your eye on for your trading die right here on Bloomberg. to speak with your trading diary for the rest of this week. Today, we're going to focus in on Alpha, Bat, and Microsoft. After the bell, Wednesday, it is the Fed decision. Of course, Thursday takes you to the Bank of England. How dovish will uh, Bailey be at the Bank of England? Will there be a vote for a cut? Amazon, Apple, Meta report earnings as well. And finally, it is the big showtime. Jobs, payrolls, wages. How hot is the U.S. economy? That was Countdown to the Open.